Welcome to the Lojo Show. Thank you for joining us. We are habitually complacent. Mabaloni has a second name. It's M A Y E R. What? There's always a persistent threat. There is no monopoly on good ideas when it comes to cybersecurity. Welcome to the Lojo Show. I am your host, Lovertra Jones. <clears throat> I am the founder and managing partner at BlackRock Engineering and Technology. I have over 20 years of cybersecurity experience, and I am honored to bring some of that experience to you. Today, we are talking to my good friend, Bob Turner. Bob is Fortinet's cybersecurity executive and thought leader for education, state, and local government. He heads up Fortinet's Education Customer Advisory Board and enjoys sharing his knowledge at the federal, state, and local level, along with higher education and K-12. Before joining Fortinet, Bob served as the CISO at the University of Wisconsin and was a senior manager of cybersecurity consulting teams supporting military education and healthcare clients. Bob served in the U.S. Navy as an enlisted radio man and a commissioned officer. He holds master's and bachelor's degrees in information security and management and has held the CISSP certification for nearly 20 years. We are very excited to have Bob's immersive knowledge and experience with us today on the show. Let us know what you think of this episode and give it a share if you enjoyed our time together. With that, we will jump right into the interview. Bob Turner on here on the Lojo Show. I like to welcome him. Bob and I go way back to him really working with a 21-year-old wet behind the ears guy sitting in his office at a consulting firm you guys probably all know about. Bob has got the experience of both being a consultant. He's also been in industry and higher ed as a CISO, and he's also now in technology and stuff too now. So I'm going to introduce him and let him give his story to you and give us the highlights of this really amazing life here. Yeah. It has been an amazing life, and I'll, I'll go back to the beginning. I, I, I started out in information security 40 <laughs> years ago, <laughs> and, and my first job was protecting information. And the way we did that was my first data server was one of those four-drawer Sergeant and Greenleaf safes with 400 pounds welded to the deck, <laughs> and it had the files, and it had the folders, and everything had to be just so to be in there. But that's really where I understood the value of information. And that's what I've always harped on since then is that everything we do in business, and whether it's in the military, whether it's in technology, whether it's as a service provider or a consumer, that data is important. And understanding how to keep it secure technologically has advanced leaps and bounds since I started doing it. But my real entree to technology from the networking perspective was not just the radio circuitry, but it was when I was in the later years of my career, we were networking on ships at the time with command and control networks. And then I went to ashore to the Allied Command Atlantic in Norfolk. And suddenly I had the command center's information system and the, the messaging systems, they were all under my, my guardianship from as the officer in charge of the facility there. And then I went to the Pentagon where we took all of the paper that was being handled around at the time, and this is in the late 90s, early 2000s, and we actually got them to receive their messages electronically. You know, pop it up on the screen, read the message. Saved a lot of paper. So I'm, I don't call myself an ecologist, but saving trees <laughs> is an important deal. Right? <laughs> You're a conservationist. And, and from that point, I, I, I retired out of the Navy as 23 years, decided not to make that a real career. Uh, and then I joined, joined that consulting firm that we alluded to before. And I had a great opportunity to help our customers, our clients, figure out how to best understand if the system had vulnerabilities and also whether it met certain certification standards. And as we, we progressed through that, that part of my career there, it was really learning about leadership and understanding that Security is a result of good leadership. Security is a result of setting the pace from the top. And security is also the result of understanding how to motivate people to do the right thing. And, and from there, I had an opportunity to go up to the University of Wisconsin-Madison and be their CISO 
I was the first full-time CISO there that, and we got to build a program. We built an awesome program up there and it's, it's still thriving today. And, and a lot of the major player team members are the ones that were there that I had an opportunity to be the leader for and help mentor them along to, to being in the role they're in today. In fact, the CISO today was our security operations center assistant director, and then he became my deputy. And then after I left, he was the interim and he earned the job outright. Set the pace. Leaders do that. Yep. Yeah. And, it's a, the the key to any successful stand up of things like cyber as it's evolved. We were calling it IA back then. At one point, yeah. information assurance. And I still remember as far as, and I talk to people today and they're like, oh, they did this in, in Diacap. They did this in Diacap. And I still remember as far as you being really a pivotal, pivotal actor and stuff there at NetWarcom when they stood that up and began that process and stuff there. And I remember how envious I was of you <laughs> as far as on what you were doing there at the time and what you were presenting and, and working with. As you made that transition to being a CISO, what were some of the, what were one of the first priorities that you knew you had to do or actually saw that had to be really mandatory for you to accomplish when you first rolled on as a CISO, since it was the first time that university had a CISO. Uh, what was the mandate for you? So my mandate was to build a program that had governance, risk, and compliance as a significant component of it. And what I really needed to understand was how the university operated. Having dealt with military training and education at the Navy Education Training Command and helping them do some preparatory work to get ready for the then DOD DIACAP, or not DIACAP, I'm sorry, Jesus, vaporizing now, they're the inspection program that they had, the cyber inspection program. And I learned a lot about how the distributed education world operates. The Navy Network Warfare, or Navy Education and Training Command at the time had something like 26 different learning centers around the world. Plus they had a core data center and then they had a couple of other administrative organizations that helped them manage Navy training. And from the classroom to the ship, it was necessary to have the best quality training and the best quality access to training uh, that they could get. And we weren't doing an awful lot of distance learning at the time, but they were really in the forefront of, of trying to figure out how that worked. The things I needed to know at the university, however, were quite different. When you deal with the politics of a large $4 billion a year business, which is what essentially, if you think the, of the university as that type of a, an organization and at that scale, there's a lot of independent operators that need to be independent to do what they do. And I'm talking about the research community mainly. The, the excitement I learned was having the ability to understand their challenges and learn to speak in their language. It wasn't military. Uh, it wasn't some of the highly classified things that I was dealing with in the military, but it was all about making sure that learning could go on. So the mission was learning. The mission was teaching, the mission was outreach, and to, to create the opportunity for that to thrive without cyber actors getting involved was really the game. And let's face it, when we were in the early 2000s doing what we were doing for our, our clients, the network was really just becoming real. We had not really even had some of those pivotal cyber events going on that we have seemingly every day now. Yep. And so we, we got to learn slowly how to worry about things. And we got to learn slowly that it's all about resilience. Uh, and in fact, the name of our team at one time, remember, was the Assurance and Resilience Team. Yep. Because we provided assurance that the system would be there when they needed it and the system would meet whatever standards were set. But it was also being resilient to whatever the cyber world was throwing at us. Now, I maintain today that it's still the same thing. You have to be strategic, which is the assurance part of it. But you also have to be proactive in order to be resilient. Yeah, acknowledging the environment that you're in. And so I went from, I did the opposite of you. I went from higher ed to DOD and servicing that and so you have those two different drivers there. DOD is let's make a rock and let's make sure it's hardened and it's a rock and it only does what we think it should do. And that's it. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah. University, you've got 
three worlds there, administrative, research, student. And trying to balance those three things was always the was always the challenge, right? You've got your research part of the university, let's mm -hmm. say computer science, engineering, whichever from that from that end, or medical and stuff too from there, oceanography and stuff, who are running these really high, you know, high end applications for high performance computing, right? That right. really has to be available for them to do their research and stuff for it. While at the same time, you've got a mix of foreign national and students and stuff too that's there, all of which are there to learn hopefully, but all of which within any type of a percentage there may have some malicious intent too, as far as what they do. And it's, it is, it's challenging. You find some of the craziest things on a university network, especially if we're talking back in, in 2000, let's say 1998, 1999, 2000 and stuff during that time, right. um, you're running a lot of uh, not necessarily enterprise network but you're running a lot of still mm -hmm. centralized computing and that's when you started getting into decentralized computing and now we're like <laughs> gravitating back towards that with cloud and stuff too so it's funny watching the yeah. stretch and contract and stretch and contract i i call that elasticity along the timeline as we learned more about how to make those connections and do that kind of high speed low drag research we also learned that in speed comes complexity and in complexity comes risk. And that is where the real communication skills that I had learned along the years came into play. But it's also the need to make sure that the mission goes on. We've often talked about the CIA triangle, the confidentiality and the integrity of data. That's mm -hmm. super important. But I maintain that in the education arena, especially, it's the availability. That's the key. Yep. If the system that is needed to conduct the research and record the results is not available, that's going to be a challenge. If the professor's lesson will not broadcast on the screen in the classroom or to the connected audience, if it's a virtual classroom, that class doesn't happen. Nope. But now we have the today's world of ransomware. Let's, def let's turn off a university service that is extremely vital, especially if you have a medical school involved, especially if you have critical things going on at the university. And if you're dealing in things like biomedical research or agricultural research where, you know, one, one missed moment of availability could ruin a crop. Yep. And it's also the fact that America is entrusting the university with their sons and daughters and their financial information. Yes. That, that you don't want to graduate from, from high school and learn that somebody stole your identity when you were 10. You certainly don't want to graduate from college with a load of, of debt that you know you have, but then also find out that you own three houses. Yep. <laughs> and it'd be nice if you could have them scot-free, but you're not going to get that. <laughs> I guess the, I guess what we used to call or talk about the universities was, Hey man, this is the free flow of information everywhere. Right. And so the quality of your education is about the free flow of information, right? Who has the biggest library, the biggest resources and stuff for you to get to that. And with the transition, I think it's pretty neat that we were able to live through the transition of, let's say, the brick and mortar library to the online resources and stuff from there. Yeah. You know, as far as with Nexus, Lexus and stuff too, for that, for law schools and, and then also the medical community and stuff too, the universities, as far as what they're able to now drill into. So these are the first folks that have really used big data and huge mm -hmm. amounts of data warehousing and stuff too, to provide the biggest knowledge base they could for their students and stuff too, in their research. Where did artificial intelligence and machine learning start? Yep that those are great technology development programs and experiments that have gone on over time. And now we can't really live without them. In fact, we're really still trying to learn more about AI and ML mm -hmm. because we know that there are nefarious uses of it. Yep. Absolutely. We've seen that already and we'll probably see more before we get a better handle on it. But it's making sure that those discoveries can continue going on that's important. It's making sure that the students are getting the best value for the time they're spending at the university and not having to repeat courses over and over because we can't seem to keep them online or the course is locked up in a ransomware debacle or even more critical that important medical research or important agricultural research or important engineering research is lost or called into question because it's been hacked. Yep. Yep. You talked about the emphasis on availability. Right. Mm -hmm. And 
and again, drawing the distinction between a university and a business, right? The business and stuff from a business standpoint, we're always going to look for both the return on investment, the intrinsic return on investment, and then of course the material return on investment and stuff within there. In a lot of cases, businesses are driven to buy the latest and greatest next tool that'll allow them to process information faster and identify issues and stuff across their organization. What was unique about being in that university environment as far as when you look at things like investing in a technology versus your people and process versus your overall governance and stuff there? How did that balance work for you guys there? The stool has three legs, people, process, and technology. And, and that balance is important to being successful. From a people perspective, the challenge I had was making sure that we all understood in a similar manner what was going on. And that involved a lot of awareness from the regular user, but it also involved a lot of understanding and advanced study from the privileged user. So if you think about the folks that I had working for me in the Office of Cybersecurity at the university, we invested in making sure that they were able to study and learn and grow. We, we use some of the popular cybersecurity vendors to provide that opportunity for them to learn things like penetration testing, incident handling for the people in the security operations center. But we also invested in spending time at conferences that dealt with GRC, Governance, Risk Management, and Compliance. And we also had our connections throughout the university to make sure that things like research projects could continue going because those research projects started coming with that clause in the contract saying you have to be compliant with a host of instructions, a host of government regulations. And there was our friend NIST 800-53. That's that little set of controls that you had to worry about. Yep. And if we could not help the people in the research and programs office, sponsored programs office understand that we were compliant, they weren't able to answer that question and you could put research in peril. Yes. If it, especially if it's something like a renewal of research that's been going on for 15, 20 years, you, you want to make sure you have that so that you don't get an, a, a penalty for interrupting that research. Yep. And, and a lot of ideas come over time and, and that's the things we got to worry about is when is that one good idea going to get held up because either the system was hacked or you weren't compliant and you lost the research opportunity? Very nice. And that's the uniqueness and stuff that we that we look at in, in terms of finding those trade-offs as far as on the people, process, technology, the stakeholders in particular. I, I remember there was always an emphasis in making sure that those researchers and those deans of those schools, those researchers were associated with, were uh, that we that, that attention was specifically paid to them and their concerns, but also what their aspirations were. Uh, now, as you made the transition from CISO to now Fortinet. Tell me about that transition. What was so compelling about Fortinet and stuff too from there in? And tell me a little bit about what you guys are doing there. Fortinet has been around for 22 years and really was built on the concept of having network security and networking converge and really create the opportunity for not only consolidation of resources and consolidation of the number of vendors in your average environment, but also to create the platform that platform concept that's going to keep all the data within an organization as secure as possible and still allow availability and still allow growth and opportunities to, to continue research and continue growing. So Fortinet, probably 2015, 2016 timeframe, the concept of convergence came together and the concept of a security fabric came together and was actually being offered as services in a bundle. So capability is really what it's all about. Yep. And, and along comes Gartner in 2021 and they write their cybersecurity mesh architecture paper, which is really just pivotal to a lot of organizations to understand that it is all about how things are meshed together into a fabric. Well, coordinate security fabric is what we've been doing since that mid 2010, 20, 2016 time range. And so now we're sitting there and, and that is, that's our driver. That's what wakes us up in the morning. That's what keeps us up at night. That's what, what helps us to understand that it's all of those components working together. And it's not, it's not like there's a, a desire to have everybody have only Fortinet. What it is just, let's deliver the capabilities and what makes sense for the business to, to thrive. And 
We exist in all the market verticals, retail and hospitality, finance, healthcare, education, <laughs> and as well as understanding the technology service providers. Those little networks around the state that are worried about providing services to K-12 organizations and school districts, the organizations that are supporting education, those are the ones I worry about. But it's also supporting the users that are out there doing things like healthcare and finance and, and retail and hospitality. And now we have our operational technology is a really thriving practice too, because there's OT just about everywhere you go. Yeah, it's smarter OT. Yeah. <laughs> smart OT. OT. Oh, your, your IOT components now as well, where you're connecting at the edge mm -hmm. and stuff too. And and taking going back to the mesh portion, I once got asked this question. I was like, what are you talking about when you say mesh or whichever? I was like, it's kind of walking into your kitchen, all right? You walk into your kitchen. I got a bunch of GE stuff all throughout my kitchen, all right? It, it, it's all GE, right? And why do I have all GE stuff throughout the kitchen? Because one, I can get communication between my GE products, right? I can tell if something's wrong, if I want to do anything that's associated with that. So it doesn't matter what I'm cooking. I have the same information and data and stuff that's there. And I have an understanding now of a single point of, of provider and stuff in that case to really say, yeah, I might be cooking my turkey a little too long in the oven. All right, my mashed potatoes that I'm trying to keep warm in the microwave might be a little too high, right? And then my, my, my dishwasher in that case is not quite ready to take on the next load, right? One of the things that I look at is that when we start talking about mesh and stuff, I look at it as, hey, that's my kitchen. I'm trying to achieve a goal and stuff that's there. And honestly, if I can get that done in, a, in one place with a technology that speaks easy with each other, integrates with one another, and gives me an ability to communicate with the specialist that's within that, that's really great. Right. Yeah. It's not saying that yeah. I have to be completely, completely homogenous for that. I can go heterogeneous as well with it. But for certain aspects, yeah, I'd like to have that mesh and that consistency and stuff that's there. And so your kitchen through the mesh has actually become your platform. Yep. Exactly. And, and its responsibility is delivering you the product at the right consistency, the right temperature all of those other things and occasionally it'll ring the little bell for you exactly, Ding, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so that's really the content and i i i i find that refreshing and when you think about just networking and security functioning together back in 2010 ish time frame we might have been talking about the security maybe about 30 percent of the time and networking the rest of the time right yeah we're fast approaching the point where security and networking are talked about just as much because we know the value of one for the other mm -hmm. or there's no reason to have security if you don't have the network but there's also going to be impacts on the network if you don't have the right security we think and i agree that by the time we get to 2030 it's going to be everything is going to be security talking about and the networking is going to be the money, the smaller part maybe it i don't know if it's 70 30 then i don't know if it's 60 40 but security is going to be where everybody starts the conversation. I need a capability. I need to move data from here to there. Or I need data that, that has functions of accuracy and viability that are well beyond what you have in your normal PC today. So we're going to be talking about the security components of that. Yep. And that's going to be the larger question because connectivity is connectivity. Yep. Yep. I think that's the real win for technology as we continue moving forward is having that ability to have that network that we know is going to be there when we need it. And we know the data is going to be accurate. And we're using tools like artificial intelligence and machine learning to verify that is the correct data. And that recording is an actual live recording versus something that has been synthetically created by technology. Yep. Yeah, it's a, and to your point about the network, I look at the organization today that the way the organizations are acting right now or the way that organizations are operating right now, the emphasis will used to be, hey, I'm going to build out this land, right? I'm going to put network admission control on that land and I'm going to have my identity and access management component within there. And it's all going to tie back to the Active Directory, right? <laughs> <laughs> Magic. We're well, both laughing because we've been there. But now yeah. the emphasis right now is I don't want to build out a whole lot of infrastructure anymore. I'd like to use somebody else's infrastructure. And that is the that is really the logical direction that a security mesh architecture should go in. You should be able to understand how the data is secured 
wherever it's at, wherever it lives. So the SASE environment, we're talking about securing the data from point of origination to the cloud and back. Yep. And those concepts are the things that are driving success in our world of cybersecurity. And we need to continue to think about that. What is next? Where are we headed from today's understanding of AI and ML? Are we going to just accept chat GPT on its face, or are we going to try to dig deeper and come alongside the AWSs and the Microsofts of the world and help create that better environment where we can really understand the value of a tool like that and not have worries about it? Yeah. And I think that's it is that for, for the last, like really for the last 40 years, we've been working with the refinement and increased capability of AI. That has been a process, an ongoing process, right? When we talk AI, and then also when we talk things like autonomous and stuff too, with that. And the way I look at it, as far as in mind, from my industry, when you mix the two AI and ML, right? The crystal ball right now says that for a lot of business models and stuff that are out there right now for services companies and stuff too, there's a, there's a clock that's ticking on, okay, what is it that your focus is going to be on in the future here? And security, when it comes to AI, is can you trust the algorithm and can you trust the data that trained the algorithm? All right. True. And we're no longer just having programmers sitting behind a screen and punching in code. We're utilizing the ability to advance leaps and bounds forward in a very short period of time. And that requires something that thinks faster than humans do. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So it is, it's a huge changer for how we live. It's a huge changer for what are the actual industries that are going to need professionals in the future. And the understanding of it really comes down to some of the, the details behind AI, not just, Hey, chat GPT, I got generative AI, but Hey, how has this been informed? How and what sources and stuff is it using in order to make its insight or provide the insights from there? And then are those sources trustworthy or is there a way to actually compromise the data and information that it's gathering insights from to create something else a little bit more malicious and stuff from that? And then the turnaround of that is now what can detect if that is the case with, with that particular algorithm or product or capability. And, and that is where the, I think that's where the two forces of, let's say good and evil <laughs> within our industry are looking at this point is how do you do that? And how do you constrain that? Because it used to say that, Hey, a blast area was just the size of my company, but now the blast area is my company, the personal lives of our employees and stuff too, that's associated with that, the research that's, that's there. And in some cases, if we're talking about healthcare, it's health and safety. And it's also the people that we do business with, and it's our partners in putting capabilities together. And it's the whole third party risk, fourth party risk, and all of those combined. And it is still bringing us to the point of understanding what we have. So I think the benefit and the value of all of the things that are going on in the world of technology today is we are learning more that we're understanding more than we did before, but we're really just at the beginning. This is the first couple of miles in a marathon that we're going to be running here. And we're going to get to the 26 mile here someday in both of our careers. And we're going to say, what else is there to do? And then somebody's going to say, well, the next marathon starts in 10 minutes. You give it a lace up them shoes. Yep. Because it can only go bigger and it can only go faster. It's not going to slow down. That's, that is so true. In our careers, we've had to keep CEOs and CFOs and years of our industries and stuff informed on this. One of the things I like to leave this conversation with and just open this question up to you is right now, when you look at these leaders of corporate organizations or even state organizations, CEOs, CFOs, and the boards there, how would you tell them to process this next step that we're talking about when it comes to AI? What's the, what's a layout and the goal that you, that they should be really shooting for when they're listening to their, to their subject matter experts in their organization about security? So let's start with the CISO. The CISO is no longer successful if all they are is a technical expert keyboard monster. 
the CISO has to be thinking about the business and the outcome of the business. And I think that I'm seeing that tectonic shift from the CISO not being part of the inner circle to the CISO being a pivotal part of the inner circle, as well as having cyber experience on the board. And it's not just they can spell it correct three out of four times. It's they have been there. They have walked in the shoes of a cybersecurity expert. They have walked in the shoes of a developer, a programmer, or the person that's working on that next regenerator of AI. We have to understand that security component where 10, 15 years ago, we talked about it 30% of the time. We have to be talking about it on an equal footing with everything else that is going on. So security has to be part of the boardroom. Security has to be part of the, the C-suite and it has to be not kept as a cloaked secret. It has to be shown how it enables. I've done a lot of research in recent, recent months on how to prove that return on the security investment. The standard model is, did we spend too much and we're really protecting very little or are we really trying to prevent against the big one happening? And when we go to that point, that's where we have to worry about what is the value of having the CISO in the C-suite, in the boardroom, because we're not going to get to the point of being truly secure until we raise up that group of leaders to be the security leaders in the organization. But it's also the organization getting smarter at the same time. Maybe one day we'll work our way out of that where the CISO might not be a necessary title. Maybe it's, we all understand security from the newest user to the most seasoned senior executive. Yeah, I once heard somebody refer to the CISO and security role as, well, you guys are the MacArthur of the World War IIs, right? <laughs> <laughs> Great for war time. Yeah. Uh, you might want to think of it over as far as when you're not at war, but you're right. It has evolved, right? It used to be that people looked at the CISO as the most, let's say, the most technically proficient in terms of in terms of security and putting that in, and maybe just a little bit obtuse as far as about everything else. But now they are truly a business leader within the organization, a business yeah. driver and stuff on that, especially when they partner with the folks that are transformation agents within those organizations and looking at how you secure those transformations and secure that new digital environment of sharing collaboration and social media as well as part of that. So it is, it's a very different look. You know, it is a business, it is a business area now for an organization and not just, Hey, an offshoot of it or an offshoot of information management. So we've come so far through the governance risk management and compliance continuum that we can no longer be satisfied just to be compliant. We have to make sure that everything in our world, whether we're the CISO or the CIO or the CTO, that our technology is being built appropriately, that our technology is as secure as possible or as secure as necessary. That, that's one of the, I draw a slight distinction between the two because you can never overbake security. You can put more security in than is necessary or even cost effective, but you really can't do too much security. That's personal opinion, <laughs> but it's also built on the fact that if we didn't focus on security, who would? That used to be the way we said it when we were in the fledgling years of having a CISO, mm -hmm. but now it's security is everybody's responsibility. Things that we've said all along, security is everybody's responsibility now have a new meaning because at any one point in a, in an organization's life cycle, security could be the one that brings it down or the security can be the one that props it up and keeps it going and growing. Very good. With, with that said, I think one of the things that my listeners are definitely going to want to do is have you on again in the future for this. But I guess what the other part is for the folks that are in our listenership, we've got CEOs, we have CIOs, we have organizations there. What does your schedule look like coming up in this, uh, this summer and stuff? Where, can, where else can they be exposed to some of the things you guys are doing at Fortinet as well as to some of the areas that you're speaking to within industry right now? So I am in the education vertical. I am speaking at sort of a string of conferences, which includes from the large get togethers of professional security people to places like Massachusetts Bay Community College, where I'm going to be actually giving a, a keynote address to their security summit. 
but I'm also going to be up in Canada talking to some folks up there in a conference environment there. And I'm constantly writing and advocating in the field of education for things like security leadership, for understanding that security operations needs to occur even in K-12 in order to be effective. Again, it's that strategic and proactive bent that we have to make sure that always exists inside of security. We can no longer afford to be reactive. We can no longer afford to be just tactical operators. We have to be thinking downstream. We have to be thinking about the tools that are there. And that's what I write about. And that's what I think about. And usually that's what I'm talking about at the conferences I go to. Excellent. Bob, man, again, it's always informative and being able to have this time to connect with you. We look forward to some of our next shows and stuff too here. Definitely appreciate the insight and the time here. That's all for this episode of The Lojo Show. If you want to see updates on the show, its upcoming guests, and more, follow our LinkedIn or our new Twitter page. If you have questions for Lojo or want to come on the show, you can send us an email at officiallojoshow at gmail.com or join our new Discord server. You have to follow our LinkedIn page to learn how to join. With that, we will say goodbye, have a great week, stay safe, and stay secure.